He is worthy of worship and praise this morning. Amen. Amen. If you've got your Bible with you, you can turn with me to uh, Micah chapter 5. We're still paused our study of Acts. We'll get back to it maybe next week, maybe the week after, and then we'll just continue on in Acts. Um, but today, of course, we turn our eyes toward Jesus. Actually, we turn our eyes toward Jesus every Sunday. Kids on the rock, y'all can leave. I always forget that. Sorry. But, of course, you know this time of year, we're, we're specifically celebrating the birth of, of our Lord and Savior in Bethlehem. As we, uh, as we turn our eyes to Him in such a way that we um, remember. Remember the salvation that He brought us. Remember the, the, the love of God who gave His only Son that we might be saved. And so as we turn to Micah chapter 5... This is probably one of the most familiar prophecies of Jesus, of the Lord being born in Bethlehem. Prophecies related to Christmas, the coming of Christ. Um, Micah was a prophet in Judah. And there was, uh, during the time that Micah prophesied, a lot of hard times, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, really tough things were going on. Long before Micah's day, the, na- the nation of Israel split into two kingdoms. There was the northern kingdom, which was uh, ten tribes of the twelve tribes of Israel. Uh, and in the prophets, when you're reading the prophets in the Old Testament, most of the time that northern kingdom will be called Ephraim or Israel. And then there was the southern kingdom which was two tribes of the 12 tribes, Benjamin and Judah, and they will be most often uh, designated as Judah in, in the prophets. And the powerhouse empire of the time was the Assyrian Empire. And during Micah's lifetime, the Assyrians swept through Israel, conquering everything in their path. Uh, They destroyed the northern kingdom, uh, conquered them, sent the north away into captivity, uh, and they conquered in Judah all the way up to the walls of Jerusalem. And you can read about it in 2 Kings. Uh, They got all the way to the walls of Jerusalem, surrounded the city, uh, laid siege to it. At the time, Hezekiah was king of of Jerusalem, and he was terrified. Uh, Eventually, just to make a long story short, God delivered the city of Jerusalem from the Assyrians. Uh, In 2 Kings 19, we're told that the angel of the Lord went forth, and 180,000 Assyrians were killed in one night, and the rest of the army fled and left all all of their stuff. Um, But during all of this turmoil, all of this invasion and conquering and all of this going on uh, with the north and in the south, Micah was prophesying and he was calling on Judah to turn back to the Lord, to repent of their sin. He foretells in Micah, in the book of Micah, he foretells the coming judgment of God uh, with both Assyria and later with Babylon. He laments the poor leadership that was happening in, in, in Jerusalem and all of this, a lot of different things. But in the midst of all the gloom and all the doom and all the judgment and all the foretelling of destruction that was coming, Micah in chapter 5 also foretells a coming deliverance. He foretells a coming salvation, a shepherd ruler who would bring peace, who would be peace for his people. A shepherd ruler who would bring victory. A king who would bring victory to God's people. And this king, this ruler, this shepherd would not be born in the great and holy city of Jerusalem, but in a little town called Bethlehem. So let's read this text together as we look at Micah's prophecy, chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. He says this, Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Some of your translations may say city of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. And then in verse 2 he says, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel who's coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor is given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord is God, and they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. 
When the Assyrian comes into our land and treads in our palaces, then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princes of men. They shall shepherd the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod, which is Babylon, at at its entrances. And he shall deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into our land and treads within our border. There's a whole lot of text there. A whole lot of stuff that... uh, needs to be unpacked as we look at Micah. So let's pray together and we'll ask God to bless our time together and we'll take it verse by verse. Father, we do love you and we do come before you today thanking you for this time, this, this, uh, uh, this worship, God, that we have been uh, honored and allowed to come into as your presence is with us in Christ and by your Spirit. Lord, we, we, we pray that you would speak to us as we read your Word. God, that you would just settle our hearts that you would turn our eyes toward you, that you would help us to push aside all the things that are uh, distracting, all the things that we got to do this afternoon, the things that are on our mind. Father, and we would just focus on who you are, focus on what you have done, focus on you, Jesus, who have, has come to save us from our sins. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the salvation that you brought. And God, we ask that you would bless us as we uh, look at your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we turn our eyes and as we get ready to this week, we're going to be, you know, you're going to be celebrating Christmas, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day with family and friends and, and all of those things. It is, it is about Jesus. And you probably heard songs, lots of sermons about the fact that it's not about the presence and not about the tree. It's about Jesus. So today as we look at Micah 5, I want us to focus on who it is that we are celebrating, who it is we're rejoicing in, who it is that indeed is our people. As he says in this verse. And the first thing that you see in the first two verses is that this Jesus who is born in Bethlehem is Savior. Micah foretells a Savior that is going to be born not in Jerusalem but in Bethlehem. Before he announces the coming of this king, in verse 1, he calls the city of Jerusalem, city of troops, to prepare itself. Siege is laid against it. He's talking about the siege of the Assyrians and back and forth in Micah, he has talked about the Assyrians Assyrians coming, but also uh, foretelling in the future the Babylonians coming to uh, destroy the city. And so he's kind of gone back and forth uh, throughout his book. So there's a little debate as to what siege he's talking about. But as Micah is writing, as Micah is prophesying, it was the Assyrians who were the bad boy on the block at the time. It was they who were conquering during Micah's day. And when he says, prepare yourselves, muster your troops, daughter of troops, siege is laid against us. He says, with a rod, they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. It's not just a picture of them conquering, not just a picture of them invading. It's a picture of them humiliating them. To strike someone on the cheek is an act of humiliation. To do so with a rod adds injury to the insult. And that's exactly what Assyria was doing. They were coming through the land. They had conquered the northern kingdom. They were coming through the southern kingdom. And they were humiliating them wherever they went. They stood outside. In 701, the the Assyrian army camped outside of Jerusalem, outside of the walls. And they sent an emissary called uh, the Rabshaka. I love that word. I want to say it all the time. Rabshaka. Isn't that a cool word? That's a cool word. They sent an emissary called the Rabshaka, and he, he stood before the city as the people were looking down at, the wall, uh, down at him from the walls, and he just hollered out these blasphemies of God. He was making fun of the people. He was mocking Israel. He was mocking their king, Hezekiah. He did this so much that the leaders of Jerusalem asked him in front of all the people to stop speaking in Hebrew so the people wouldn't understand what he was saying. In 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 26 and 27, it says, Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and Shebna and Joah said to the Rabshakeh, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it. Do not speak to us in the language of Judah within the hearing of the people who are on the wall. But the Rabshakeh said to them, Has my master sent me to speak these words to your master and to you and not to the men sitting on the wall who are doomed with you to eat their own dung and drink their own urine? It's pretty gross, pretty humiliating. He was saying such things that they were saying, please stop saying this stuff in this language where everybody can understand. 
And he was saying, no, 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 I, I've come to, to embarrass you, to, to show you that your defeat is imminent. And uh, all through this, this was, this was a desperate time for those people in Jerusalem, for those people in Judea. But during all of this fear, during all of this calamity, during all this destruction and humiliation that was going on, God through Micah foretold that there is coming a king that will put an end to this. There's coming a Savior, he says in verse 2. O Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, who is to be one who is to be a ruler. Ephrathah is the, the region of Judah that Bethlehem was in. There's another town called Bethlehem in the land of Zebulun. He's distinguishing between the two. But Bethlehem is no Jerusalem. It's just a tiny little nowhere place. In fact, it's so small... That when Joshua was divvying up the land to the tribes in the book of Joshua, he starts listing all of the towns that are going to be in the territory of Judah. He lists like something like 115 towns. Bethlehem is not on the list because it's so small. It's this tiny little backwater nowhere place. But this town of Bethlehem did have a history among Israel. Most memorably, it was the town that David, the great King David, was born where he was from. And so when Micah foretells that a ruler in Israel is going to come out of Bethlehem, the memories that would have called forth in the people that heard him would be of the mighty King David that would come to deliver us. And God's promise to David that one from his line is going to sit on the throne forever. And everyone knew, everyone knew that Micah was talking about the Messiah when he said a ruler in Israel is going to come forth from Bethlehem. One who's coming forth is from old of ancient days. They all knew what he meant was there's a Messiah coming. We know that because in Matthew chapter 2, when the wise men came from the east and they, they talked to Herod about where the king of the Jews was to be born, it says that Herod called the chief priests together and they quoted Micah chapter 5 verse 2. It says, when Herod the king heard this, heard that the wise men were looking for the king of the Jews, he was troubled and Jerusalem with him and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ, the Messiah, was to be born. And they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. Then they quote Isaiah chapter 5, verse 2. They knew that he was talking, Michael was talking about the Messiah. Even the regular people of Jerusalem and of Judea knew. When Jesus made the statement, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. It says in John 7, 40, when they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was, who will shepherd my people Israel? That's what Micah said. So even the people of, of, the, of the city of Jerusalem, of, of Galilee, of, of Judea, knew that when Micah foretold this, he was talking about the Messiah. The Christ is to come. The ruler of Israel, the shepherd of Israel is to come from Bethlehem. They all knew what Micah meant. A Savior is going to come, a Messiah of God. He won't be just an ordinary ruler. He says this in verse 2. He said, a ruler in Israel is going to come from you, Bethlehem. And then he says, his coming forth is from old. From ancient days. The point he's making is that yes, this one would be born in Bethlehem. But being born, his being born there is not his beginning. It's not where he is from. He comes, he comes into Bethlehem, yes. But his coming forth is from ancient days. Literally it says days of eternity. If you have a King James Version, it doesn't say ancient days. It says everlasting days. He is from old, from everlasting. He's the Son of God from eternity past to be born in Bethlehem. When you understand this, it really shows you the magnitude of the salvation that Jesus Christ brought. From all eternity, before there was any creation whatsoever, before there were trees and atmosphere and anything created, God existed for all eternity as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is love. 
Because even before there was a creation, God existed in perfect love relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God created all of this, all of us, not because He had a need, not because He needed us to do something for Him, but as an overflow of that love relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to bring us, His image bearers, into that relationship, into that relationship of love that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit experienced from all eternity, that we might be brought in relationship to Him to glorify His name, to show forth His nature. So He created Adam and walked with Him in the cool of the day. Of course, you know the story, right? He, sin entered the picture, separated us from that relationship, from that holy God. No longer are we able to be in perfect relationship, not with this holy God. We couldn't be brought into this holy communion of love between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So God the Son, who existed as God for all eternity, the second person of the Trinity took upon the nature of a man. He lived the perfect life that you and I couldn't live, gave Himself as payment for my sin, for your sin, rose from the grave, conquered sin and death, and ascended back to heaven as both God and man. And as He does... All of those who are united with Him in salvation, He brings us back into that love relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit where we can be, where we can be united with our God, reconciled to our God, in relationship with our God because we have been united with Christ in salvation. That's why the Bible says that we who are in Him are seated In Him, in heavenly places already. Listen, this Savior born in Bethlehem, Micah foretold, He he comes to Bethlehem indeed, but His coming forth is from old, from, from eternal days, from ancient days. He's a Savior born from everlasting because with Him comes the salvation that was intended from all of the beginning of creation. He is a Savior born in Bethlehem that we celebrate this time of year. Second thing you see in Micah is that he's a shepherd for his people. He says, Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of the brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. Micah also foretells that until the Messiah comes, until this ruler is born in Israel, says God will give them up. Meaning he will leave them to their own devices, leave them to their own ways, leave them in the judgment of their sin and their idolatry, leave them to experience the trials of the invading nations that have come and are to come, leave them to be, to be conquered, even to be exiled from the land in which he promised them. Assyria was the rod of God's judgment. He says so in Isaiah chapter 10. They destroyed the northern kingdom, sent them into ca- captivity. A hundred years later, Babylon comes, destroys the southern kingdom, destroys Jerusalem, sent them into captivity. And as Ezekiel and that group were going into captivity, Ezekiel says he saw the glory of the Lord leave the temple before it was destroyed. And even after Israel came back 70 years later, under Ezra, Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, The glory of the Lord didn't return to the temple that they rebuilt. In fact, He doesn't return at all. Not until a faithful night out in a field when an angel and then a host of angels appeared to a group of shepherds. God's glory left the temple during Ezekiel's day. And after... The, after the Old Testament times were over, 400 years of silence. The glory of the Lord had not returned. And then one night, out in a field, before a bunch of shepherds, an angel announced the birth of the Messiah. And for the first time in centuries, it said, the glory of the Lord shone round about them. Verse 3 says that this this shepherd for his people, this ruler in Israel, 
It says, it says God will give them up until he comes. That's a big word, isn't it? Until. Therefore, he shall give them up until. Until she who is in labor gives birth. Them being given up won't be the final end. When the Messiah comes, it says, the the rest of the brothers will return to Israel, meaning they will turn to Messiah. They will turn to Him. And it says in verse 4, He will stand. He will endure. He will do what David's other descendants couldn't do. He will establish His throne forever. And He will endure. And it says He will shepherd His flock in the strength of the Lord. Man, by saying saying He will be a shepherd coming from Bethlehem, the picture of King David would have been great in their mind. And probably a host of pictures come to mind when you talk about a shepherd anyway, especially a shepherd from Bethlehem. A shepherd leads the sheep. He provides for the needs of the sheep. He feeds the sheep. He he, he protects the sheep. He gathers them. He goes after the lost sheep. But because he is a shepherd from Bethlehem, they would have no doubt remembered the words of the shepherd from Bethlehem, David, in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, you know. It's not just for funerals. It's for us too. Psalm, okay, laugh. Come on, help me out here, people. What's wrong with y'all? I'm doing my best. Make a joke. <laughs> Psalm 23 is, the Lord's my shepherd, shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, restores my soul. He'll lead his people, ruler over Israel, ruler over his people. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because he's with me. He sets a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And this shepherd picture was picked up in John chapter 10 by Jesus who said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And because he has done that, because he has been and is the shepherd of his people, laying down his life for his sheep He's not just a savior from Bethlehem. He's not just a shepherd for his people. He's also a sovereign who is victorious over every enemy. It says at the end of verse 4, in the beginning of verse 5, he says, they shall dwell secure. His people shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. And look at the beginning of verse 5. He shall be their peace. Not only will he shepherd the flock, but his kingdom will grow until his name is great to the ends of the earth. Not just national Israel, but all nations. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. And his people will dwell secure because of his great name. And it doesn't just say that his people will have peace. It says he will be their peace. Jesus Himself is our peace. Just as the angels announced to the shepherds, there is peace now between God and man. God and man are reconciled. I hope you were here last week. We talked about God's justice and God's holiness and God's righteousness. Unless there is perfection, unless there is righteousness, unless there is no sin whatsoever, you cannot be reconciled to God. He's a perfect judge. But Jesus is the perfect substitute for your sin, the perfect sacrifice, giving Himself for you. He reconciles us with a holy God. Romans 5.1 says, Having been justified by faith, We have peace with God. And because we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, and He doesn't see our sin, if we're united with Christ and His salvation is ours, He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ upon our life. And because we have that peace with God, we also have peace with one another in the body of Christ. Paul uses this phrase... And he shall be their peace. 
He uses it in Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians 2, he's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles being united in one body in Jesus Christ. Let me just read to you three or four verses from chapter 2 of Ephesians. Paul says, But now in Jesus Christ, you who were once far off, Gentiles is who he's talking about, have been brought near the covenant community by the blood of Christ. And look at, he quotes Micah, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, Jew and Gentile, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, Jew and Gentile, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing hostility. We have peace with God. We have peace with one another, for Christ is our peace. He is our peace. And finally, we have victory over all of our enemies. What David said in Psalm 23, He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemy. We have victory. Micah finishes this section He says, when the Assyrian comes into our land and treads in our palaces, then make sure you follow the pronouns right here. It's always good. Follow the pronouns in Scripture. It'll really help you to interpret what's being said. He says, then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princes of men, and they shall shepherd the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod at its entrance, Babylon, and go back to he shall deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into our land and treads within our border. Here, Micah is using the picture of Assyria because that was the threat as he was writing. The point he's making is that he delivers from all enemies, but at the the time, during that day, Assyria is who the people were afraid of. Assyria is the the ones who are marching through the land. And he tells, uh, Micah has foretold in in the future, this coming Messiah, this coming ruler, this coming shepherd. And so here, he doesn't mean that in the far future, one day in Bethlehem, when the Messiah is born, the Assyrian Empire is going to be, you know, revive and attack again. No, he's using using their current context, the context of the reader, to show them a future reality. You see the picture that he's painting? That they will have victory over all of their enemies. Micah says that God's people, when the Messiah comes, God's people will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princes of men. He says they will shepherd Assyria, meaning with the rod. They will conquer Assyria. They will conquer all the way up to the gates of Nimrod at its entrance, Nimrod being Babylon. He will raise up leaders. He will empower His people as shepherds and princes. They will conquer and be victorious. But what really is He saying right there? When He says we'll raise seven shepherds and eight princes of men, He's reminding them once again of King David. In 2 Samuel 5.1, when David is anointed king before Israel... It says this, Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and your flesh. In times past when Saul was king over us, it was you who led, it was you who led out and brought in Israel. What he just said the ruler of Israel would do, shepherd his people. And the Lord said to you, You shall be shepherd of my people, Israel, and you shall be prince over Israel. You see what, what he's saying here when he's talking about seven shepherds and eight princes? Micah's saying when the Messiah comes, when the ruler comes, he will raise up lots of Davids. It won't be just David the king going out. There'll be lots and lots of Davids, seven shepherds, eight princes of men, lots of people after God's own heart. Shepherds and princes all will be priests and kings to our God, all of God's people, and they will go forth conquering. But even recognizing this, when he says, you know, he, when he comes, the rule is going to be lots of Davids going forth. 
Even recognizing this, he's quick to show us who the victory belongs to. In verse 6, he doesn't say, he doesn't say, and they will conquer, and they will, they will deliver us, or we will deliver ourselves. He said, they shall conquer, going forth, shepherding Assyria and Nimrod. But then he says, and he, the Messiah, shall deliver us. The victory belongs to him, the one who is born in Bethlehem. He is the one who will deliver us from the enemy. And Jesus indeed did so. He gave us victory over every enemy, over sin, over death, over judgment, over every enemy that we face. Paul says so in Colossians 2. Right there at verse 15, he's talking about Jesus on the cross. Colossians 2, 15, he says, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Him. He's talking about at His death, The gospel has conquered every enemy, every principality, every power. Indeed, you and I will still have to fight in this life. It's still a spiritual war that's going on, but victory has already been won. He has delivered us as we go forth as shepherds and princes to our God because He, the chief shepherd, has done what we could not do. And now... We live and we fight by His strength, by His Spirit, just as David. So listen, church, as we, as we celebrate the coming of the Lord, we celebrate the coming of the Lord to Bethlehem, the child in the manger who would grow and give Himself on the cross, the fulfillment of God's purpose. As we celebrate Christmas, we have a hope that transcends all others. The baby in a manger didn't stay a baby in a manger. He has gone forth conquering and to conquer and has done so. He has defeated every enemy. And He has raised up a people for His name, filled us with the Holy Spirit of the living God and set us on mission to make His name great to the ends of the earth. All things Micah prophesied. So as we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate the coming of peace. He is our peace. But that peace is only for those who trust in His name. The Lord chastises the false prophets in Jeremiah's day, Jeremiah 6, saying, They heal the wounds of my people lightly, crying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. There is no peace between you and God unless you come by faith through the Son who was born in Bethlehem and gave His life on a cross and rose from the grave. There can be no peace between you and God. None. He is a holy God. And every sin separates you from your God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. But Jesus has conquered. There can be no peace unless you come through Him. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And no one will come to the Father. No one will come to the Father unless they come through Him. And also, there can be no peace in your soul unless you come to this Savior. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all you who are weary, heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He said, My yoke is easy, my burden is light. He said, You will find rest for your soul. You can celebrate the birth of Jesus and Christmas with family and trees and presents. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with trees. We got one in my house. It's, it's, it's because of her, it ain't because of me. You can celebrate all of that your whole life and know that, yes, we're celebrating the birth of Jesus. We're celebrating Jesus coming in Bethlehem. But if you don't trust Him as your Savior and Lord, you will not be reconciled to God when you stand before Him. He is the only door to the sheepfold. He is the only way. He alone is the sacrifice for your sin. Your eternal destiny depends on the question this morning, 
What will you do with this Jesus? Will you submit to him in faith as Savior and Lord? Or will you turn from him and live your own way? It, and although your eternal destiny is the most important, your life right now depends on it. What will you do with this Savior from Bethlehem, this shepherd of his people, this sovereign who has conquered every enemy? He calls you today to trust in him, to give him your heart and life, to put all of your hopes in being right with God upon one who died on a cross 2,000 something years ago and rose from the grave to take all of the chips of your life, as it were, and push them over onto him and say, he is what I am banking on and nothing more. Will you do that today? Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you. Thank you for your word, God. We thank you for the salvation that you have brought. We thank you for sending your son. We thank you for just this time of year where, where everyone turns from the distractions of life and, and focuses in on the fact that indeed, Jesus, you did come and you were born. You did take the nature of man and were born in Bethlehem. You lived and dwelt among us. You showed us the nature of God and you gave your perfect life on a cross so that my sin could be atoned so that my payment could be made and you gave the wages of sin, which is death, so that I might be spared. Thank you, Lord, for giving yourself for my sin. Thank you for rising from the grave so that I too will rise because I've been united with you. And God, if there's anyone in here that does not know you, that has not trusted in you, God, I pray that you would call them. I pray that your spirit would speak to them, that you would draw them to yourself, that you would cause them to call out upon you for salvation, to trust in you, to be reconciled with you. God, and help us as believers to know that this is our call, our mission, to glorify your name in every step we take, every place we go, every moment of every day to glorify your name and make disciples for you are worthy of all praise and all honor and all glory for all eternity. God, we thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. As always, I'm going to stand right down here. If you want to come, I would love to speak with you. Give your heart and life to Christ. Trust in Him and He will save you. Will you stand with me?